All right. Hey guys, this is Savannah from earthandwater.co. Today I am here with Jean Bissett. She is an artist, which is absolutely wonderful. I've been looking over your stuff and some of, it's really beautiful, the textures that you have going on. Thank you so much. Um, wait till you see the new stuff. We are not launching any of it yet. Um, and I do definitely want to talk about it because it's something that's brand new. It's actually never been done before, not by me or any other artist. And so it's it's a bit of a big deal. So I'm really happy to be on, on the show with you, um, mostly because of the match in the frequency that I felt when I was invited to, to speak with you. Um, it literally dives right into what I'm doing currently as an artist. And with everything coming through with AI, for example, and how, you know, our art's going to get stolen and it's it's not going to be important anymore and, and we're not going to be able to blah, 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 blah. Um, it's kind of a big deal because AI has no soul. Okay. It's not even possible for AI to do what a human can do. Okay. And what I'm talking about is literally we're we're trademarking it or we're trying to trademark it and it's called conscious art which is literally channeled it's a co-creation with the divine and its intention and its frequencies are being grounded onto the planet to literally assist in raising our consciousness and it's by divine order it's it's just something that uh, it dropped in um, after what I guess I would call, you know, quote unquote, my awakening. Although, you know, I, I don't think that that's something that has an end game, you know, like we're, we're not suddenly awake. Or a beginning, I really. I <laughs> like, right. Um, we're basically all in kindergarten when it, when it comes to that, you know, when people, oh, yeah. people running around telling you how awake they are, and that, that's how you know they're not. <laughs> Honestly, though. <laughs> But I, you know, I've had some, I've had some dark nights and I don't think it's just one that takes you there. You know, I think it's, uh, it's, it's Pima Chodron, or I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly, but um, she talks about like a million tiny deaths and it's within, it's within that, that space, that journey that we actually learn something about ourselves and we become more and more conscious as time goes on. So yeah, this it's it's kind of a big deal. It's 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 a very special thing that we're doing right now. Um, so the new work is is completely different. So I'm, I'm glad you love the 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 older iteration of me, um, and I'm dying to show people what we're doing and everybody that you know my team, my publicist, my marketing director, my partner in business, my teacher, my guru. They're all like, no, no. We're not launching any of this yet. It's killing me, right? It's killing me. Is it still paint? It's still paint. Um, in fact, next year we're launching an exhibition slash healing event. It's a transformative event and it's going global. Okay. And it's 10 massive paintings. They're, um, you know, like 10, 12 feet wide and 12 feet high and they're they're all channeled they're divine messages they're not even my paintings I'm just the translator I'm I'm like the interpretive painter now put the right color you know on the brush and 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 do this thing so your platform is a beautiful platform for me to to be hanging out with you on for sure yeah no there's uh art in and of itself you know there's so many different modalities we can um talk about paint and we can talk about music and we can talk about sculptures and like there's the amount of art that we are capable of is absolutely incredible and it does come from a deep place within like you can find an artist who is really painting from their soul um people who think that they're not creative or they're not artsy I feel are just not getting in tune in touch enough with who they are and the world around them and where they come from and you know how we're a part of it all mm -hmm. um being creative is not about putting paint on canvas it's it's our nature it's how it's our blueprint right we were created 
to be creators. Yes. And, you know, I, I have kind of a saying, if we're not creating, we're consuming. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. You know, right. Um, or if we're not living, we're dying. Right. And living is in the creative process, not just about, I mean, my language is color, but it's, it's not about that. Everybody's creating something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when, and I, and I speak to clients about this all the time. And when I do work with clients, and I don't do a ton of one-on-one -on -one work anymore. Um, I just don't have the time. But when I do, I talk a lot about this because usually, you know, there are people who want to be more creative and don't feel creative or they've gotten stuck <clears throat> or they're patterning their trauma, mm -hmm. um, you know, looping round and round and round and they can't figure out how to get off the, the hamster wheel. Um, and the way off the hamster wheel, like we, we kind of have to die, right? We have to let ourselves fall apart so that we can put new pieces back together in, in, a, in a different way, in a, in a higher frequency way, so to speak. And um, I mean, that's part of the whole journey. That's why we're here. Yeah, our greatest work of art is ourselves, right? And sometimes, yeah. you know, it can be scary to let go of the pieces that we have already used to sculpt ourselves because- yeah you know safety and familiarity and that's right. that's right moving on to something else is not only scary in the sense of like you know we have a lot of um imposter syndrome <laughs> to yeah. Yeah. ourselves you gotta snort out of me on that one that's <laughs> yeah it's it's oh man imposter syndrome that's that's an interesting topic all in and of itself and when we begin to literally understand that you know the person that is sitting in front of you isn't even real you know like right i'm right i'm just an avatar in the game of mm -hmm. universal earth soupiness <laughs> and we're existing someplace else you know um which is much bigger than who we are and so when we begin to understand the multidimensionality of who we are and that we're living out many different experiences, the imposter syndrome thing becomes a non-event because we're, we're right. We, we don't like I'm sitting with you in the personality of Jean Bissett right now, but tomorrow I could have a completely different thing that comes through me depending on the circumstances, right? depending on what emotions I'm feeling or what, you know, what, what is happening that I'm seeing with my eyes and feeling the, the, the material experience of where we are. But imposter syndrome is, is a no thing really, because we are already not who we think we are. <laughs> so <I'm pretty> <laughs> it's like Ball the universal imposter, universal imposter, right? We get very attached to our, our stories though. We do. So, you know, the, the pain is inevitable because it's a part of the polarity of this universe, but the suffering is not inevitable. And I'll be the first to admit that addiction to suffering is part of, you know, what I've experienced in, in my world as well, right? Like, it's this totally feels, familiar. feels familiar. So we go back to it, regardless of whether it's our highest timeline or not, we just keep going back um Michael Singer the suffering artist is a total archetype oh my gosh right <laughs> you know and we used to be so I have some experiences I have memories of other lifetimes that I've been in and as an artist many 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 times like and in this lifetime I was born with a crayon in my hand and that's why because I've already done this so many times and um, I'm sorry, if you hear my whining dog in the background, I'm just letting it be real. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. Mine's a barker, too. So uh, I can go outside and he's not gonna. And he's like a two year old. If I'm talking to somebody like I am here, he you know how little ones will be like, that's the moment they want your attention. Yep. Anyway, uh, we used to be royalty. We were we were revered because we could do what we did. And if memory serves me correct, the reason that that was taken from us, and not just visual artists, all art forms, 
is because we were the rebels. We were the nonconformists. We were the ones standing out on the skinny branches, reaching beyond the signposts with, with no net. And that's a scary body to be in when the, those who would like to control our universe are trying to control our universe. So, right. I mean, it's, it's, uh, and so right. Starving artists became a legitimate archetype and, you know, I'm, I'm here to help abolish that, you know, (laughs) if, if I can, um, it's, it's unnecessary to, to live in that romanticized state. It's, there's nothing romantic about being poor. I, I agree completely. And I think a lot of artists feel like they have to, um suffer to be able to produce their art because they feel like su- they connect suffering to the depths at which creation good creation comes from and you know as a society we're so in tune with the suffering depth but so out of tune with the depth of joy and love and the other side of the spectrum well, I mean, I agree with you um, in that I do believe some artists feel as though they can only create through suffering. I've never actually been that kind of artist. Okay. Um, I, I, in fact, if I'm that, if I'm, su- if I, if I'm in a suffering state, I literally can't create anymore because the suffering state is not where the divine speaks. Yeah. Right. That's, that's all our, that's, that's my ego state. And again, it's not that I don't do it. My goodness, I'm in a body. So I'm, you know, on any given day, but if I can, you know, I've learned that all is mind, everything is in the mind and, and quote unquote, nothing has any meaning. Right. And so I, so I, I am not, I am not that artist. And again, I don't romanticize the suffering of, the you know right the, the poverty stricken artist living in the back room sleeping on a dusty cot you know <laughs> um and to some degree i i think i think it it was pink that said she can't write music unless she's in angst but yeah um i live in asheville and we are filled with spirituality and and an artist on every single corner and we have the gamut of artists here. We do have the the limited belief, you know, artist that lives here. And then we have a very thriving modality of artists that live here. Um, so it, we run the gamut where we are in Asheville. It's it's pretty cool actually. Um, and I've and I've spoken to you know to groups as well around this very thing. And some artists get really angry because um, they feel like they're selling out if they make money doing what they're doing. And that's just a whole different podcast. <laughs> but I mean, not really, because it's still healing in the sense of um, healing what we think life should be. And mm-hmm. yeah, because, you know, that's all just um, our belief systems. So we have to reform our belief systems around. No, we talk about healing scarcity mindset all the time because you can't have abundance in doing what you love doing what you're good at doing what you're passionate at and which is what I feel like you know because we're all artists every single one of us is an art artist it's just a matter of figuring out what your art is and you know it's real easy to recognize art in the form of a painting or music or a sculpture but you know being an architect is a form of art being a mother is an art form being a sister being a friend being you know everything on this planet that we are capable of being that is a possibility that we could choose to be is an art form and finding our art form I feel that we should really children encourage that's the word I'm looking for encourage children I forget words sometimes (laughs) (laughs) encourage you get to be my age (laughs) (laughs) Um, to find their art form because, um, man, I try not to be resentful towards, you know, anybody or anything. Our life turns out the way it turns out. We're dealt the cards were dealt for a reason, I feel. And, Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes I sit back and I'm like, man, if only I had been encouraged instead of discouraged Mm -hmm. in my own art form, I could be leagues aware ahead of where I am right now, because, 
Um, I spent my, I was an artist as a child. I, I was drawing all the time. That's all I did was sit around and draw wow. and um, write poems and stories. So I tried so hard to get away from that because I was told, you know, that's dumb. That's not a real career. You can't, artists don't make money until they're dead. And uh, so I was like, well, okay. So I tried so hard to find a quote unquote real job or real modality to focus on. And every time I just kept circling back to this and back to writing and back to, I don't really draw anymore, but I do do a lot of um, graphic art. So like online, I do a lot of that. Nice. Yeah. So th that gives you the outlet though, right? Okay. It doesn't really matter what the modality is. Nope. And, and frankly, you know, I can speak to that as well because it's, I wasn't discouraged as a young person, um, at least not by anybody that mattered, you know, but I would say that I also wasn't encouraged, you know, um, and when I was younger, I used art as my, I, I did use art as my healing. I used it as my escape. I used okay. it, you know, right. I mean, I always had a journal or, you know, a, a, an unlined journal so that I could draw and I had the little pencil kit with me all the time. But what was really interesting is in high school, in our yearbook, like I got voted most artistic. Me too. And, really? And I was mad about it. <laughs> I started, right. Because I was like, well, what good is that going to do me? And I thought, oh, my gosh. So I was taught you know, that, that this was not something that was sustainable. Mm -hmm. And it took me many years, like I'm in my sixties now. So I've, you know, been around the block several times and it's, it's really not until now, or well, I shouldn't say that in 2006, when I first decided that I, I really want to be an artist and I want to be an artist that makes money. You know, I was a photographer before that and I did commercial photography. I was very successful at it. And, and it turned out it was sort of my shadow career. And even though it was still very creative and it was a part of me that was able to create a, a very high level income doing that, I could tell that it wasn't quite the right thing. Right. And what I'm realizing now, so in, so in 2006, I came, you know, back out as an artist and, and what I will share is I used to try to teach other artists this level of success and I couldn't, it was really painful to try and share with people how quote unquote, I did it because I'm not going to lie. It truly did come naturally. It was my dharmic path. Yeah. And so I started painting and I sculpt as well. And the galleries were taking notice. Uh, literally all I had to do was put it out into the world. And within three to five years, I was in over 20 galleries across the country in Canada and Mexico. I've sold paintings all over the world, as far as New Zealand, Italy, That's you awesome. know, it's, it's really awesome. And what happened though was about six years ago I became really unhappy I mean I was I was grilling the the pieces out I was working really hard that's a lot of galleries to to yeah. service um burnout is a thing well oh for sure and what I started to notice and that would have been considered my mid-career right is that there wasn't anything in my world that would make me happy and I thought, my God, you're doing the thing, right? You're doing the thing that other people do when they retire. That's how much fun what you do is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was, I was in pain. I was really in pain. And so the way I tell the story is kind of, I want to sort of reframe it because the way I used to tell the story is that like I burned it all down. But what I realized happened is that I was recalibrating and when we are, when we're looking to the outside, right, money, fame, relationships, whatever it is, there is something, there's a big hole on yeah. the inside, right? And so I pulled my work off the market, which was horrifyingly courageous. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. I mean, because it really was a big income. It was, it was a high six figure income that I was maintaining. And I'm proud of that, you know, yeah, you should be. And, 
I pulled it all off the market and I, my whole life changed. I moved, I got a divorce. I, I went through some crazy personal hardship and it was, that was the turning point. And it took me four to five years which sounds like a long time, but in the scheme of things, it's kind of not. Yeah. And frankly, I was retired at that point. I was like, okay, I had enough money to do what I need, you know, to just live out the rest of my life. And I was like, okay, if you don't go crazy, you're going to make it. Everything's going to be fine. And you never have to work again. And then a year ago, it just, it kind of dropped back in again. Right. And I say that like it was easy. I hired a spiritual coach and mentor who is a monk ordained in India. And she's now a friend and a, and a business partner and, and a co-creator in this venture for next year. We're also launching a clothing line, um, none of which I can talk about yet because, right, it's <laughs> they're all just like- I'm trading. <laughs> sing from the rooftops you know and and my my strategists are like there's a strategy gene you know and I'm like, the strategy okay. is to tell as many people as we can it's so true oh my gosh but you know like we're still getting trademarks and and llcing and all of that stuff so we're trying to figure out you know the whole step-by-step oh, -step thing that's happening and it's all gorgeous and beautiful and I'm so excited about all of it, but I'm, I, but I'm excited about my life, not because I'm making art again, but because that, that empty hole is beginning to get filled by, by me Yeah, right? and standing, standing in my, in my sovereignty, you know, it, not that life is perfect. It's never perfect, but there's a happiness now that I wake up not and not every day, but right there, there's like, there's this new knowing and that truly is that higher conscious connection to something we call divine. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I, I don't love sounding like an evangelist, but it kind of feels like it a little bit. It's like, whoa, there really is more to all of this and there's nothing to do with what we thought. Oh yeah. yeah. Spiritualism is really powerful. I mean, you know, most of our cultures in this day and time have been found founded on some sort of spiritualism, whether it be um, New Age stuff or, you know, Christianity or Hinduism or, you know, there's tons and tons and tons of different spiritual modalities. But uh, I don't even know, modalities doesn't feel like the word. And I've already said it like eight times. But anyway, yeah, the point gets across. And um, I have come to a, the conclusion. Okay, so I was raised very heavily Christian. I was, me and my friend were talking yesterday about church came up. And I was like, how many times do you, did you go to church regularly? And she was like, I went a few times. I was like, what do you mean a few times? <laughs> right. like, couple of handfuls maybe 15 20 at the most and I was like man that sounds nice I was born and raised in church until I was right. 15 is when I had the choice finally to not go every week and um boy man that was an experience and um you know I, I never felt like it was quite right for me and then but there was being born and raised in Alabama <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say <laughs> there were no other options you know your your choices if you wanted any kind of spiritualism at all and I always felt that there was you know there was something spiritual I was always really drawn to stuff like magic and fairies and dragons and that kind of stuff but as far as like actual structure goes mm -hmm. with the spiritualism our choices were church of christ or Baptist, or Pentecostal, or, you know, just <laughs> different versions of Christianity. And I really like that we have, you know, the internet really brought some more choices and options to us, which I am forever thankful for, because I was not in a good place. But we're finding now we're all kind of studying the different directions and the different structures, and taking out of each one what we feel like sits well with our soul which sure. is um I, I kind of I really want to see in the future and like people are going to hate me when I say this but 
instead of it being like, I am Hindu or I am Christian. You're like, okay, we're all just people doing our best. And the whole point of spirituality is not to be labeled your to label yourself as much as it is to allow labels to fall away so that you can step into your own divine self in congruency with all the other individuals on the planet side by side, you know, because um, people get so wrapped up in the labels and the identification of who they are that they forget that we're all people Mm -hmm. cut from the same cloth out Mm -hmm. here doing our best. And it doesn't matter what name you call it. What matters is does, do you feel good? Are you helping others feel good? Are we helping each other? Are we helping ourselves? Are we taking from where we need? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I often say it's all spiritual. Yeah. Every bit of it. The good, the bad, the ugly, the hard, the easy, the joyful, the it's all, it's all oneness, Mm -hmm. right? That's what it means really. And I have a bit of a different take on the, the dogma of religion, I I do personally believe that religion was created to to some degree to keep us somewhat enslaved. I agree completely. Right, so that we could feel less than yes. the quote unquote creator. And I was raised similarly. I you know my father was a very devout Catholic, which is so funny because devout you know I I I used to I used to kind of internally cry bullshit all the time right I was like this is bullshit I don't understand what's going on here Mm -hmm. so I you know I openly called it all the time right I mean I I say it now and it's not because I'm trying to bash religion that's the last thing I want to do it's very helpful for a lot of people Mm -hmm. at a certain level of you know consciousness or knowingness and again it's all spiritual But the minute I stepped out of the dogma or the building, you know, the building, for example, something just dropped in the other day because I'm I'm revisiting the Course in Miracles, um, which Marianne Williamson talks about all the time. And it was written by, channeled by a person who was an atheist before it was written, right? And all of a sudden, you know, right, Jesus or or the man we call Jesus or the son of God we call Jesus it was channeling his, right, his, his, he came to teach us all kinds of really cool stuff and it got kind of co-opted, right? And I have a funny saying, I go, Jesus up there going, it's not what I said. <laughs> you know? yes. So. It's just a, it's just a, a really interesting thing when you start to understand that yes, the mystical aspects of all of these religions is somewhat accurate. There are many many truths, but there are also many untruths mm-hmm. that you know. And now we're discovering, and well, we've been discovering gospels that we didn't even know existed like mary magdalene the gospel of mary magdalene and the gospel of thomas and the gospel of judas who supposedly was in cahoots with jesus here's what we're gonna do it's gonna suck for you because you're gonna be the bad guy for eternity but this is you know and so the stories are different and and you're like okay so what lives inside of me what what do I decide is my truth and and the angry punishing god was not my truth Mm -hmm. so it yeah it's a it's a journey into you're right into the self and bringing this back to creating art or or creating anything I mean when we create art we almost feel like we're creating something out of nothing Mm -hmm. there is no nothing right at the same time everything is nothing Mm -hmm. we're making it up as we go right every bit of it so you know i mean we could take this into a million different directions but all i know is anything that divides is not my truth yes that right there because you know in the end all we really have is each other so that's right and again you know you mentioned um cut from the same cloth i have a similar metaphor that i use is sort of like the tapestry right and i'm just one thread and a particular color in that tapestry. But if you pull that thread out of the tapestry, the tapestry doesn't work anymore. There's Mm -hmm. something missing, right? You're not the drop in the ocean, you're the ocean in the drop. Mm -hmm. 
that's real. And once we start to understand that, like we can't kill spiders anymore. <laughs> like it's just you know, like, literally, yes. I uh, this outside, right? <laughs> we just have this whole new level of compassion. We can't get angry at people who hurt us anymore because we understand our own responsibility as to why we brought that in. Mm. And it, this gets harder when, you know, islands are on fire and people are being murdered and children are being stolen and trafficked. And it gets harder to understand that all loving force because we like to judge others and ourselves and we're very, very good at it. Yes. So, and this is what um, the, the name of our, um, our immersive is Gaia Rising. Okay. And the paintings are, they're awakening paintings. One of them, I'll, I'll share some because I can't take it a moment longer not to. Um, but one of them is the return of the elders and they're all um, the ancients coming back. And I gotta tell you a funny story about this. So they're all dark skinned people because they're actually, they're, they're being brought to the canvas and they're from an area in Africa. And in ancient times, Africans were dark skinned and many shades of dark skinned, but they had blue and green eyes. And I'm painting these dark skinned people with blue and green eyes. And I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? Like, that's just so uncommon. Well, it wasn't. Anyway, I've got this massive painting and there's nine elders. There's nine people that have come forward in this painting and they all have a power animal. And I, I mean, it's a massive painting. And I was having some work done on my driveway. And almost everybody on that team was a dark skinned person, except for one guy. And now I'm as white as they come. I mean, there's just, there's no denying, you know, my Celtic background, <laughs> but at one point there was a guy on like the steamroller thing. I was having asphalt put, put down, which is not the interesting part of the story. And he's looking in my studio and he's like seeing this and it's all unbelievably filled with color, right? And he's driving by and he's driving by. I can see he's just, he can't look away, right? Finally, he stops his machinery and he calls me over and he says, what's going on in your studio? Like, what? holy cow, like he, he had no words, right? And so I, I started to explain to him what this painting was about. He gets off his piece of machinery, walks into the, he's like, can I go in? I'm like, absolutely. He walks into the studio and he's like, mouth start, it's just hanging open. And next thing you know, one by one, all the guys, and these are just like, you know, like worker guys, right? Just your average, I don't know. I don't want to be, you know, mean because I, I think it, it's, it's not like, right. They're just guys. They had shovels in their hands and they had dirt on their feet. Right. And they're standing in front of my painting and like their mouths are hanging open. And I'm talking and finally one guy looks over at me and he's got this kind of funny look on his face. Right. And I go, I know I'm really white, huh? <laughs> Starts laughing because he's like, yeah, what's the deal? Like you're painting all these dark skinned people. I said, well, I believe this is actually where we're all from. Like we were, we came to this planet as dark skinned. And then th there's this whole other story that, that I didn't go into with the guy as to why I think that whole quote unquote white supremacy, you know, came about. Mm -hmm. But our originations were that we were dark skinned and he, we just, it opened up the best conversation. And one of the guys was a fundamentalist born again, Christian. And he just launched into the most beautiful dissertation about like what I was doing and how he was affected by it and how he was feeling. And can he take a picture and he wants to share it with his children and his wife. And I thought, oh my God. If one, uh, so there'll be 14 paintings in all and they will exhibit in a circle and, and it, the circle will be called a healing chamber and the, the, it'll have music, it'll have, it'll, we're trying to figure out how to like, remember when the Van Gogh thing came through and you could like walk into his paintings. Yeah. We're the sort of trying thing. to, we're trying to, you know, bring it to the world in this way. But what it's designed to do is to literally transform people and raise their consciousness, which is 
back to your platform and back to those of us who are lighthouses or star seeds or whatever we call ourselves. And our work here is really important because this is like the U-turn of the planet back home, right? And for those who've been in charge for a really long time, they don't want that to happen. No. Yeah. So uh, sorry, I didn't mean to launch into this massive- No, it's been wonderful. Because that's what art is supposed to do is start conversations. Well, not only that, conscious art is activated with what I'm calling light codes. And there are keys that will be put into the piece. And that's where the co-creation of, you know, my mentor and I come together. And each and every piece we have actually created through conversation and we're starting to record the conversations and now there's talk about the possibility of doing a documentary. And I mean, there's all kinds of really amazing stuff happening. But conscious art is art that activates a knowingness inside of you to release suffering and to bring in more joy, which is our natural state of being. Right. And we all know how to innately do that. It's just a remembering uh, it is a re- right, and it's an unlearning. Yeah, of all the things. This is where I get really excited about it because the other day I was working on on. So th- I have two kinds of art that I make. I make this conscious art where I literally channel the divine. I am not the artist, and then I create pieces that I I call or my mentor calls the five D person because that's where I'm actually from in in the universe i'm from this place that that is all about color and emotion and so when i'm creating those paintings those are currently conscious but they're not activated until the activation comes in through the co-creation of myself and my partner who is the monk who channels that healing is the best way i can put it And so they actually change the frequency in the home that they reside in or in the building that they reside in. So this is something that's actually kind of far beyond what art already does. Yeah. And it's uh, it's amazing to experience. Um, Similar to uh, crystal grids? Crystal grids I know very little about, but I'm going to say yes. Um, Because, right, crystals are alive. Mm. And, and, you know, I studied magic as well. I studied shamanism. I, all, I did all the things. <laughs> and what I'm learning is that, for example, magic is quite persuasive and manipulative. Hmm. And it's not that there's black magic or white magic. There are black mag- magicians and white magicians, right? Like there's, there's, and, oh, and it's, it's whatever you do with it. One comes from sort of the dark state and one comes from, you know, the white light, you know, not to launch into all of that. But yeah, crystals are alive. Everything's alive. Mm. And so when we create these paintings, they're not objects anymore. They're alive Mm. and they're conscious and they're like breathing and living. And that's the only way I can describe it right now. Um, when we launch this exhibition and we're hoping to launch at a festival in March, we'll see, we haven't, we haven't pitched it yet, but we're gonna do some practice uh, runs here in Asheville in the fall. And um, I will tell you that I, I finished a painting fairly recently that again, I haven't shown the world. It's not one of these paintings. It's, it's a different, it's just me painting, right? And it's an archetypal painting. And it is of five women that are no longer on the planet who I have admired. And I kind of consider my divine feminine ancestors. And then Rena, Rena Parikh is is my friend and partner and, and mentor's name. She said, let me activate, let's activate the painting with the keys. Like, like we're going to activate our clothing line and we're going to activate the art. And I said, okay. And so what we came up with was all the accolades that these women embodied and that I want to embody, courage, sovereignty, creative genius, um, freedom, right? And so then I had to choose all these things that I did not want anymore. Addictions, grasping, um, pining, 
fear, right? And so what she does is she channels in the codes and then puts them into the painting. I don't even know how to put words to what happened next. I was like, what just happened? And she's like, you tell me. And I go, I don't know. I just like, and this was a week ago and it's still unfolding hmm. because we don't, we don't like the, the, the divine, our guides, whatever, right? Our higher selves, they don't want us to become destabilized. They want us to actually heal. Yeah. So the destabilization or the dark night of the soul is no longer necessary. We just believe it is. Yeah. It's like suffering. So I'm, I'm really excited to bring this kind of art and ground this onto the planet. Um, and I feel blessed for real, for real. I feel so lucky. I'm grateful every day that like, I get to do this. <laughs> yeah, right. It's amazing. It is. Uh, thank you. Like you're saying, we absolutely, we don't have to go through the suffering in order to learn and activate and heal. I have clients all the time that are like, well, how do I know, how do I know if I'm healed? Like, well, you just, uh, you stop questioning it for one. You just know that you are, yeah. but we're all, we're all moving into um, this whole new earth that we literally don't have words for yet. Yeah, that's right. And a lot of it is because all of this stuff has been suppressed for so long. And, you know, a lot of it's that we weren't ready for it yet. That's um, right. A lot of it's lost knowledge that's resurfacing. There's just a lot of things coming together right now and trying to explain it with the limited vocabulary that we have that does not encompass what it is at all and right. trying to tie it together with like the science that we have, the science that we're discovering, the science that we're like, there's all sorts of science. We're like, I don't, we don't know, dude. We don't know, but it's a thing it's here and you know here's the best words we have to explain it you know and we're, then we're on the front lines huh? we're on the front lines yeah we're literally at the front you know i think it's abraham hicks that talks about like are you are you enjoying your how did how do they put it are you enjoying but it's the same right like you're on the we're on the front lines we're making it so yes. um and it's happening it's happening now. It's, it's not that we're not going to have access to people, you know, that, that we have access to now, but what I'm noticing is that people are not, who are not in a vibrational match, like with, and this isn't a hierarchy thing, they fall away. Yeah. You know, we always we'll talk have to, to them, bring it but back, you think. For real. And, and so the, because we're a holographic universe, it's already split. Yeah. It has already happened. And, and we we're choosing now, right? Like one foot over here, one foot over here, that, that's not sustainable for much longer because we, we actually have to make the jump. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who are doing this work, mm -hmm. we're the bridge builders, right? Yeah. We're like, okay, everybody, I get it. Like, it's hard and it's this and it's that and it's painful and it's devastating and it's all of those things. I'm not, I do not have my head in the sand, Yeah. but, but it's all because we're choosing differently and not everybody is choosing differently. No. Right. So, I mean, I just yeah. feel like that's, and this is what we came to do during this time, apparently, right? And we, we came to do this work, to help others to wake up, you know, and understand that it can be done differently. Yes, it has to be done differently. We it's, This is not sustainable. No, and, and nobody, nobody's happy in the way that we have created things. We've disconnected ourselves from everything that makes us happy, everything that it sits well with our soul for sure yeah i saw um, that you have a book what's that you have a book i do have a book it is it is in editing um i will share the title because it's so it's a, it's a book that i call it you know you how you have those little tiny books that and you sit on the toilet and then you read the book right it's, this is not a very big book it's a tiny book with a big message um when I was going through what I'm calling my dark night of the soul, my writing coach at the time called me and said, you know, how, like, how are you today? And I said, I am in the blanket for it today. And she's like, oh my God, that's the book I want you to write. And I'm like, 
seriously? Because I was actually working on something else. And I go, oh my God, that's so real, right? So it is a book about how to build the blanket for it. Remember when we were kids and your parents, yes. did you ever write and give the kids all the sheets and stuff? I still do. It's right. It's <laughs> by step, how you build one, why you build it. It's a healing chamber of its own kind. Yeah. Um, I didn't even know if I was going to publish it, to be honest with you. I wrote it for me, you know, and then I was having a conversation with, again, my publicist. And she's like, you wrote a book. I go, yeah, I don't really talk about it. She's like, why? <laughs> so, so it is getting ready to go into the hands of, of editing. Um, and there'll be lots of rewrites, I'm sure, and things like that. But it 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 kind of makes fun of grief a little bit because we we have to. Yeah. Right? We have to at some point, we have to go, okay, listen. We have to stop this addiction, Laugh across. This suffering, right? Um, so yes, there there is a book, and and there'll be others, you know, along the way. I'm sure. In fact, we're we're um, developing a line of oracle decks to go with the Gaia Rising um, retreat and tour. I see something on your website about oracle cards. Yep, um, I've done two in the past limited edition oracle decks. They they're gone. They've sold out. Um, and years and years ago, it was like maybe seven years ago that I did this and people still have them. It's so weird. Every once in a while, something will come up on Facebook and somebody's like, I still use your cars. I'm like, what? That's crazy. What are you talking about? Um, but yeah, we're going to do several decks and they're, they'll be using the guy rising paintings and aspects and symbols of the paintings. And so people will be able to sort of, it's sort of a self-study. It'll come, you know, with a workbook and we just have some amazing ideas that uh, the the ideas are coming in fast and furious at this point. I just have to write them down and put them it on. Grows, I, right? I, More I get, like, right. It's, and I think that's what they mean by divine timing because it's like, oh my God, like, you know, then, you know, other stuff will come in like, oh, we could do a game board, like rich dad, poor dad. Like we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. And it's like, all right, enough already. Like, stop the flow, and and then you're like, no, no, no. I'm just kidding. Don't stop the flow. <laughs> it's a hard um, balancing act because you know I, we can only do so much at a time. That's right. That's right. And so what we've done is we've put everything kind of on a list, and we're like, and a lot of these will like this will meld into that, right? Yeah. They'll they'll mesh together, and like I'm kind of visualizing almost like this explosion that will occur at some point, right? Like the pressure is building, we're putting printers in place and we're putting, you know, digital people in place and we're putting videography in place and, and photography in place. And, and all of a sudden I think what's gonna happen is it's just gonna go boom. And I'm like, okay, let's, <laughs> let's put our helmets on and hope for the best, but it's, it's nothing but joy at this point, really. I I wake up every day excited. So that is awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks for letting me uh, flap my gums about it all. It's it's. Yes, I'm excited to. I'm excited to see it all. I can't wait till it all releases and we get a a visual. Yeah. Of for sure. awesome yeah. Thing. yeah. We're working on the website now, so there'll be some teaser visuals. So it'll all be right. fun. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Clubs. Right. For sure. All right. Well, thank you so much for having it or for coming on today. I was, I was going to say for having me on because, you know, I do so many of these. You <laughs> <laughs> I totally get it. And I'm sure your audience completely understands. Yeah. It's been a genuine pleasure. Thank you for asking. It was great meeting you. I can't wait to spend more time at some point in the future. I hope to see you maybe at one of our events. So we'll see. I would love that. Yeah, that would be awesome. And give me a reason to come visit my friend up in Nashville. Indeed. Yes. Yes, I agree. Well, thank you so much. I yeah. appreciate you as well. All right. Would you like to share with people where they can find you? And of course, I'll link everything. Absolutely. Yeah. You can find me at jeanbissett.com. You can Google my name and I come up all over the place because I have really smart SEO people. Yeah. Um, you can find me on Facebook at under my name again you can find me on instagram you can find me on youtube you can find me on linkedin I, there is almost okay. no place i know the only one i don't do is tiktok because i don't get it so 
<laughs> but yeah, you can like well, I said, you'll be on TikTok after this. Yeah. Okay. I'll, oh my gosh. That's so, I'll, I'll take this TikTok by default. That's wonderful. I love it. Plus, TikTok is a very young audience, so I I think it's. I've been told a couple times like you probably should be on TikTok. I'm like I just don't have the time. So, but we'll figure it out. Absolutely. All right. Well, you have a great day and thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, that was a very inspiring episode with Jean Bissett. Please go follow her. She's awesome. If you want to catch these episodes with full visuals, unedited, complete video intact, join the Patreon. They're over there. It also gives you early access because I don't have to edit them. I'm just uploading them as soon as we do them. So you get multiple episodes at a higher rate of frequency than what you do through the audio here waiting for them to come out. You can also enjoy yoga videos and meditations and journaling prompts and all sorts of things over there. So join us on the Patreon, come hang out with us in the Facebook group, and until next time, I love you all. Thank you for being here. I couldn't do any of it without your support.